Okay, over to you, Igor. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm super excited to to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about GitOps for Terraform because since we sign up for this meetup, we kind of changed the tagline of what we do. But no, it's really the same thing. Um, can I get a sense of who here used Terraform? Oh, everyone. Okay, that's good. That, that is not missing the mark. So basically, well, a bit of intro. My name is Igor. I am one of the founders of this little open source DevOps startup called Digger. And uh, when I say little, like literally little, we are five people. We are seed stage. We're figuring it out. And yeah, we're building an open source GitOps tool that helps deploy Terraform. What we're going to talk about today is kind of four parts, loosely. One is what is actually the problem with CI, CD, and Terraform. Um, there are quite a few. Um, they're not obvious. Um, we're going to look at some open source solutions and non-open source as well, but mainly the open source one because we are one of them. And then I'm going to show you a quick live demo of, of Digger. Hopefully it works. Demo gods be with us. And then some Q&A. Shouldn't take too long. So with that, let's go first about the problem. So naturally, if you write Terraform code, you probably want some sort of storage for it, which is probably Git. And then you probably want some sort of a CI CD pipeline for it, um, which GitOps and whatnot. And naively and naturally, many people just start with running Terraform in whatever CI they use, like GitHub Actions or whatever. And what's the problem with that? Not much if you're the only one doing that. And if the org is small and if you just push and deploy and repeat that in isolation, then that's perfectly fine. But unfortunately, in, in most team set settings, it's not quite as simple, mainly because Terraform has state. So we all know this state file that we probably want to store in S3 bucket or in some remote backend or whatever it is. So to deal with that, um, well, what, what actually is the problem it creates? There are a few kind of choke points I want to go over. First one, probably the most painful, is if you have more than one plan running at the same time, that can create a little bit of a race condition, let's say. Um, specific example, if let's say you open a PR with some change that creates a resource. So you open one PR, that's great. You run a plan um, against that branch. Everything's fine. And then someone else creates another PR. What happens then? If that PR also creates a resource, um, then you have kind of two branches of reality, right? But what if that second PR applies its changes before the first? You're actually going to have that second part succeed. But then when you run the first PR, when you run apply of the first PR's code, um, against the state that has been already updated, um, what you have is a deletion of the resource that was just provisioned. You probably don't want that. So that's one major problem, um, PR race condition. That's why tools like Atlantis introduce the higher level locks. That's why Spacelift has lock and unlock, but we'll get to that. Um, so that's one major problem. Now, another thing to consider is failing applies because unlike with normal code, um, you kind of have it, you cannot really count on apply working. Um, you could run into quotas, you could run into just random Terraform flakiness. Um, everyone knows that. So if you have multiple environments, you actually are kind of dealing with a matrix. And this slide is, by the way, is a shameless um, kind of ripoff of Lee Yu's um, picture. We just redrew it. Um, so the link um, is supposed to be on the screen, but it's not on the screen anyway. Um, there's an awesome article called Banes of Terraform Collaboration by Li Yu, and we just copied their, their content. So just cred crediting them. Um, the gist is you cannot really count on applies succeeding even if your plan was successful. 
how does it translate into um, CI/CD challenge? Well, that raises the question: What do you do? Do you apply first or do you merge first? Because normally um, your apply is kind of deployment in in DevOps sense, right? You kind of produce an artifact loosely, which is a plan, and then you kind of, well, let me deploy, right? And apply is, fine, is supposed to be the deployment stage if you do analogies to kind of application code. But because you cannot count on applies, well, that's not gonna work, right? So you may need to rerun apply multiple times with different versions of the code. Um, and then how do you do that? If you merge, then apply, then it fails, then you need to create another PR, um, and then that can repeat for like three times, times the number of environment. That's not really good. Well, okay, let's maybe not um, apply after merge. Let's, let's apply before merge. And then what you have, you have an open PR. Let's say you apply and it succeeds. In that case, um, you kind of have your production infrastructure ahead of your main branch. That's not right. And also referring to Lee Yu's term, merge apply dilemma, that's, that's the term he coined, um, at least not trivial. So you kind of need to do something about that if you're implementing CI CD um, for Terraform. Um, one common solution is to always rebase from main. Um, some others are again kind of repo wide locks. I'll get to that. Um, so yeah. That's our, that are the main problems, there are more obviously, and people do all sorts of actions, GitHub actions that you could reuse that just run Terraform binary. Um, but there are commercial solutions for that as well, because um, it's pretty painful. Um, some to name obviously HashiCorp's Terraform Cloud, um, which um, I'm assuming many here has used um, remote backend, nice jobs, uh, you, can, you can pretty much have your Terraform runs managed by Terraform um, Cloud, by HashiCorp. Then there's a challenger called Spacelift, which does a lot of things better than, than Hashi from kind of UX perspective and other things. And Zero Scaler worth mentioning. These are commercial, non-open source. Um, and then there is the open source part. Um, one is Atlantis, established project. Um, I think they created, it was created in 2015, um, quite a long time ago. Um, and us was created two and a half months ago. Um, so yeah, we're basically trying to build a newer, better Atlantis. Um, but the, the, the summary here, uh, I wanted to highlight that um, until recently, the assumption was that in order to run CI CD for Terraform, you need a separate CI stack. That's what all these commercial tools in Atlantis do. They have their own compute, jobs. Um, that compute can be managed. It can be um, you know, um, self-hosted if you are on enterprise tier. Um, you can have some mix with like orchestrator managed and, and, and runners in, in your cloud account if you want. Um, that been kind of the consensus. And Atlantis follows suit, Atlantis does um, is basically Jenkins for Terraform. Um, single VM, you can have a bunch of nodes perhaps there, but um, Terraform is going to run in, in the memory space of that VM, um, just like Jenkins does, something like that. Um, so we thought we could do it differently, that's, that's, that's why we're presenting. Um, but before, before I go into how um, Digger does it, let's look at a use case of a company called DoorDash. We might have heard of them. They are big users of Atlantis. They um, actually fork them and maintain their fork for their own internal reasons. Um, this diagram is redrawn from their company blog. Um, link here, I'll, um, the link should be available, I think, after the talk. So, um, should, should go through. Um, basically, they implemented internal self-service for their teams. Um, they run their infrastructure on Terraform. Um, there's quite a lot to unpack here, so I'm gonna go kind of left to right. And um, let's say user creates a PR, um, that's step number one. And um, then what the, the immediate next step, um, Atlantis picks up um, the, the Git hook from the PR um, and generates a plan. Um, then the next step, again, Atlantis as a, as a, as a runner, of infrastructure related jobs, actually downloads policies, um, OPA policies to check that Terraform plan against their internal um, security standards. Then 
Atlantis um, worker, which is a standalone job with its logs, with um, they, I think they also have UI for logs and things like that. Um, so it executes conf test, which is uh, running on these policies um, through open policy agent. Um, then going backwards, step number five, policy evaluation is done. Um, step number six, um, let's say Terraform plan, conf test, that's successful. Atlantis leaves a comment um, in the PR. Um, and then finally, step number seven, user um, invokes the, the apply command. Um, well, actually, not finally. There's also the, the last step, Terraform provisioning resources. So this is kind of left to right, right to left flow. Um, one thing to note here is when Atlantis does something, it interacts with GitHub, but the actual running of, of that um, Terraform binary or OPA agent or whatever it is, is actually happening on the Atlantis um, compute. So it's basically like a, like a separate um, CI stack Atlantis runs, GitHub action waits. That's kind of a weird arrangement, um, but, well, that's the tool that's been there forever um, and gets full credit for, for that. Um, this is kind of a more detailed illustration of that same concept. You have your CI, GitHub actions or, I don't know, circle or whatever. Um, you have some jobs that it orchestrates and it provides you logs and it supposedly scales and you can configure it to be secure and provision all sorts of access to your high privileged accounts um, and separate, uh, I don't know, by tiers of access, whatever you want to do. Um, that's your CI. And then you have a separate thing that is effectively CI with the same stack, but not CI. It's like you self-hosted and it's a little CI in a little box. That's kind of how Atlantis works. That's the, the state of the tooling today. Um, so we noticed that, and we kind of thought it doesn't make 100% sense, maybe 99% sense, uh, but not 100. So what we tried to do, we tried to minimize the, the difference between um, you know, what we offer and, and what's industry standard. Um, so you don't have to, with Digger, you don't have to replicate the CI, the compute, whatever. Um, we suspect that the commercial tools I mentioned did it just because they could charge for minutes. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like if you can charge for CI minutes, um, then that's kind of good business. And um, that's why lots of venture capital went into that. Um, it makes a ton of sense. But architecturally, technically, um, may not make full sense. So um, we basically thought we could build a thin wrapper that would allow you to um, avoid the problems I mentioned earlier of running Terraform in your existing CI system, GitHub Actions or something like that. Um, that's the idea behind Digger. Um, yeah, now I'm going to try to show you a demo of that. Hope it works. If it doesn't, um, have a little backup, kind of a static one. So you can still see the screen, that's good. So here I have a demo repo um, of a simple, let me probably zoom in, probably gonna be better. Uh -uh. That should be good. So basically we have two environments as folders. I know there are opinions on that, and some people prefer environments as folders, others prefer single environment with TFRs, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, this example just chooses that. Um, it's a basic repo, it has Digger YAML at the root. That's all that needed to configure Digger, by the way. But um, let's say I want to make a change. So um, we have main TF, which has some stupid null resources, and I'm going to create another stupid null resource. Um, so I'm going to do that. Well, probably need to edit first. So, and let's do a commit. Commit a... Yeah, you're right. Good spot. So, we're gonna create a new branch. I'm gonna create a PR. First change. I'm gonna create a PR. So, Let's see, it's gonna be a little laggy because, because GitHub Actions webhooks are not like instantaneous, but let's see what happens.
<clears throat> well, I was joking when I said it might not work, but. There was some outage in GitHub. Yes. Yeah, we had that. No freaking way. <laughs> okay. Uh, that'd be challenging. Let's see what we have. Shit, I can no longer blame Wi Fi. <laughs> well, there is something. Incident with actions. Whoo, whispered! Okay. Okay, it's not us, it's not us, it's not us. Um, but anyway, I have a little backup here. Um, so, what I was going to show you is this. <laughs> that's a, that's a pre prepared PR, but, but anyway. What I was going to show you is that um, when you create a PR, you have um, a lock at the PR level um, that's going to prevent you from running plans concurrently or if it's the only PR for a given state, um, it's going to just say that the lock is acquired by a given PR. And then it's going to post a plan in your um, pull request comments, just like this. Um, so yeah, normal plan, here's a null resource. And then you can do comment ops, you can do dig a reply, you can provide a bunch of arguments. Um, yeah, you're going to see the output of, of apply um, and apply and close the PR and if the PR is um, merged, um, the lock will be released. So the point of that is if you have multiple PRs competing, remember the um, competing plans case, um, you don't run into troubles. Um, then you can also specify projects. That I can show you by the way. Um, so let's go to the root project here. Let's check the digger YAML. Syntax is pretty simple. You have a list of projects and you have a directory. So you can specify um, the same directory as many times as you want. Um, there are a bunch of options. Check out the docs, which you can list here. But basically, if you run digger plan, it's going to pick up the right project and run um, and only create locks based on the project. So if you're changing dev, um, it's not going to lock prod and the other way around. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, let's say, let's call it condensed demo. Um, thanks, GitHub, but, but anyways. So let's go back to the slides. You've seen the demo live, obviously it did work. Um, a few kind of main ideas behind the tool we're building is that we thought we could be like, could build a, an adapter layer, if you will, for different CI systems. Currently GitHub Actions is the main because it's, it's cool and it's hype and most people enjoy it. But we also support GitLab since last week. Um, building integration with Bitbucket, Azure DevOps is coming soon because it's been requested more than, well, only second to GitLab. Um, so any CI system, Digger is a thin wrapper. We're in Golang, by the way, so if any Go fans here, um, we're looking for um, contributors. So um, you run Digger instead of Terraform binary. Simple thing, um, there's a ready-made action. And uh, it can, run Terraform, apply, and other Terraform commands against um, three major cloud providers. And the locks um, that I showed you um, earlier in a live demo, um, they are stored actually natively in your cloud account. You could have a separate account for that. Um, in AWS, we use DynamoDB because it's kind of a convention on Azure, um, I think it's storage tables, and on GCP, it's buckets. Um, it's a pretty simple mechanism, it just stores an entry per project per unit of state. Um, so the other main feature we are kind of excited about is comment ops. We're thinking maybe this should be also extended to Slack, but for now GitHub comments is, is the main way to interact. You can do digger plan, digger reply, and, and see the outputs so teams can collaborate. Um, same as Atlantis, by the way, and, and, and other tools, we didn't, didn't invent this. And um, PR level locks, which uh, you've seen in the successful demo, um, what um, locks the PR and prevents you from um, concurrent changes. So that's the um, other key feature. 
A few other things, we added support to for Terragrant recently, uh, so that's been requested a lot, so you can run either Terraform or Terragrant, simple option, simple config option to support Tele Terragrant. Um, you also don't have to share keys, some um, organizations have a strict policy where even the CI system um, doesn't have enough privilege to um, run your kind of high privilege Terraform executor. So we support OIDC for um, GCP and um, AWS, Azure OIDC equivalent coming soon. Then it's drop-in replacement for Atlantis, that's kind of the idea, simple YAML. Um, at the root of the repo, we'll do the job, just list the projects. Uh, we also persist plans, that also can be persist persisted in your cloud account natively. Um, Roadmap is, by the way, super open to ideas and contributions. It's, it's in our um, GitHub homepage. Uh, we shipped this stuff on the left quite recently, and this stuff on the right is coming soon. Um, configurable workflows is something being requested a lot. GitLab is actually already there. Um, Bitbucket coming. Few people who use Bitbucket will, uh, will enjoy it. Um, many more to the right, further, further down. So, yeah, that's kind of it. Q&A, if any questions, please also give us a star on GitHub. All right, does anyone have a question for, uh, for Igor? Let's go to you, Anna. Okay. Thank you for the presentation and the demo. My question is, uh, we are big users of GitHub Actions and Terraform, specifically Terraform Enterprise, but to some extent Terraform Open Source as well. What would you say are the key strengths compared to a GitHub Actions workload that uses parallelism equal one for a specific environment and saving the plan output to be applied after? It's a bit difficult to express this way, but I can go over it again. It, it makes sense. Parallelism equals one, um, I assume just prevents parallel runs and that's it, right? So you can split the workflow to do this for a specific environment, like in the repo you showed. So parallelism equals one for the dev workflow, the pro workflow, and each of these workflows can save its plan. So at the apply stage, the plan, the same plan will be the one that is applied, so there won't be any uh, entry in the state. I, I don't think there is, like, I mean, probably shouldn't say that, but like, there isn't much of, 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 of a significant improvement. The idea of the tool is more like, you don't have to configure it yourself. Um, drop in action, it just works. Um, we do little things like, you know, check out latest on every, um, on every PR, things like that. But if that works, you probably should keep using that. Good, good, next question. So over here. So it looks like you've got a repo level lock in there. If you've got multiple engineers needing to make changes, how can you undo that lock? Because while you've got the lock there, other engineers can't be committing, planning, going through a PR process. So if I turn around, look at a Terraform um, commit and go, oh, that doesn't follow corporate standards because of net resource naming conventions, other things like that. So the plan would apply, but there are PR type level comments saying, please do, do things differently. Can this unlock, let other engineers go through and um, so plan, apply, etc. If I understand you correctly, um, you're kind of referring to a long-lived PR that isn't really supposed to be merged anytime soon case? Is that...? Would request to merge soon because the engineer thinks it's done, but people reviewing it have different opinions. Got it. Um, I think I got it. So there are two things here. One, we are kind of implicitly relying on people doing same things about blast radius, so you aren't really supposed to have massive projects, and that, that's not supposed to happen in terms of kind of code base overlap. Um, but if you actually run into that situation, uh, which many people do, um, there is a digger unlock command where you can literally unlock, 
um, and you know save everyone else's time. Um, it's more like we think we literally copied Atlantis implementation in this. The default logic in Atlantis is exactly the same as default logic in Digger. Um, it made sense. Um, we also thinking make it to make it configurable in some way. Um, would, would love your input how it should work. Um, I don't think we have kind of deeper insight on, on, on that part. Great, cool. Um, next question to go over here. There you go. Hi. So uh, I was actually watching for the part where you'll be explaining about collaborative work. Part of the question he asked, you know, when you have several um, engineers working at the same time and um, wanting to deploy for previous projects, how, what, what's, what's the plan? Is that not considered or is it in the I don't fully understand. Do you mean like um, more than one team? Or, or more than one team, um, Well, nothing should prevent you from doing that because literally, um, well, you could also have multiple repos, right? So um, project level lock is still repo level. And then if you have multiple infrastructures, multiple projects, you can have multiple repos and they aren't supposed to um, overlap on state. Mm -hmm. um, did, did, does that answer your question? I'm not, not no, 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 fully no. sure. Could, could you maybe rephrase? Yeah, so... You go, yeah. yeah so go where we have multiple teams, that's one case. In another case, we could have one team, let's isolate just one of these multiple teams now. You have several engineers working on the same um, code base, right? And he's trying to deploy. He, the system already has a lock on him. I also want to make a review on that. He needs my review on it. Or how do you? Oh, so then in this case, the lock is based on an sort of an intersection of a PR and a state. So every PR. Um, supposed to affect only one um, state file somewhere, right? Um, or the one sequence of state files, like um, let's say it's um, um, you're making a change to um, your um, RDS database A and you want to apply it for a um, dev environment. So in theory you could also apply it to um, staging and prod, but let's, let's just think of dev. So the lock is acquired exclusively of that intersection, PR intersect environment. And so if um, another engineer in your team making a change that is not uh, touching that um, state for that environment, you're free to do whatever you want. Um, that also is, is, is how Atlantis works. There, there is a little startup called Terra Team that improved on that, um, where you can specify scope of a lock with a dash P option. So we have that as well. Um, you can say uh, digger plan or digger apply dash p um, in in the comment, and you can have uh, you can specifically kind of point it to a folder which you wanna um, kind of scope the lock to. Um, does it does it answer your question? Nice one, well done. Okay, just time for one more. So by default, the digger lock is p r as long as it is stable. So. We said he are been working for like a couple of days. And another member of the team wants to also like uh, submit a PR for review. If the first one is still locked, so the other one cannot even do the plan, so the reviewer cannot have like uh, I can get the answer the plan is healthy. <coughs> so. so yeah, that really depends on what the PR does. So you have a repo and in the repo you're supposed to have Probably you have multiple, you know, folders or at least some pieces of your infrastructure. It's not one huge state file. If your infrastructure is 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 built in such a way that you have one state file for everything, then you probably want a repo level lock. Um, that's kind of scary. But if you if you choose that route, then yeah, um, the lock will be global. Um, but if you split your your um, states into smaller pieces to reduce bl blast radius, to do things you know in isolation, a bit like microservices, but for Terraform, um, you should not have uh, these kind of overlaps um, across different team members. Brilliant. Feels like um, quite a lot of variations of the same problem that people have, and uh, it's tricky, it, right? Like that yeah. it took.